Hello and welcome to Lecture 10 from the course From Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, professor for your course, and this is the first in a series of lectures where we try to understand probability distribution of the residuals are fit to model to the data. Recall that in process modeling, we had a set of data and we tried to break it up into two parts, a systematic part and a random part. The systematic part is described by our model and the random part is given by the residuals. The residual is the data minus the model. When we did ordinary least squares regression, we assumed a particular distribution, a normal distribution, and we want to check that assumption. We want to find out what is the true distribution of the random variable that is residuals. Recall that there are a number of assumptions when we perform this modeling using ordinary least squares regression, OLS regression. Uh, we assume that our model is perfect, that the mean value, expectation value of the residuals is zero. We assume that all of our residuals are independent and identically distributed, and that that distribution is normal. Finally, we assume that the values of each of the xi are known exactly, input or predictor variables, we're going to, for the next few lectures, talk about how we assess assumption number five. How do we know that the distribution of residuals is a normal distribution with zero mean and a fixed standard deviation sigma epsilon? Well, one way tend to think that it's probably a good assumption is when the central limit theorem applies. Hopefully all of you are very familiar with the idea of the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem says, if I have a random variable that's equal to the summation of lots of other small random variables, then that summation will have a probability distribution that's about equal to a normal distribution, even if each individual independent error source is not normally distributed. So if, I, if my total error is the sum of the contributions of lots of small errors, and we expect our total error to be about normally distributed. However, the central limit theorem is not some law of physics. It doesn't force the residuals of our fits to always be normal. In fact, there are many, many cases when we do a fit to a set of data and we get residuals that are not normally distributed. There is no guarantee that the central limit theorem will apply. It does apply in a lot of cases, and so we do see frequently residuals with approximately normally distributed uh, values. You can't count on it. You can't guarantee it. So every time you do an ordinary least squares regression, you need to check to see if your residuals are approximately normally distributed. Otherwise, we'll be violating one of the assumptions that goes into our ordinary least squares regression. Now, just as a very, very quick review, the equation for a normal distribution is given here. This is the PDF, the probability distribution function for that Gaussian normal distribution. There are two parameters, mu the mean and sigma the standard deviation. The cumulative distribution function is an error function. And uh, as you know, the expectation value of this random variable would be mu, the parameter that represents the mean for the population. And the variance of this random variable x would be sigma squared, where sigma is the standard deviation, which is our spread parameter for the normal distribution. But not every distribution is normal. We can see departures from normality. And the departures from normality fall into two general broad classes. The first kind of departure from normality is called skew. Our normal distribution is perfectly symmetrical about its mean. The, the, the size and, and spread of the data larger than the mean is about the same, is exactly the same for a normal distribution as values that are less than the mean. Perfectly symmetric. But real data may not be symmetric. It could be skewed to the right or skewed to the left. If it's skewed to the right, that means the, the tail going off to the right in our graph uh, for values larger than the mean or the mode or the median um, 
have higher probability values, probability density to function values than they otherwise expect. Skewed left means you get higher probabilities of occurrence of small values of that variable. Skewed right and skewed left often happen when there's some physical limit that says going too large or going too small is really hard for this physical system. So you have kind of a wall of possibility and the probability drops off very quickly when you hit that wall. Not on the other side. Uh, so we, we will often see these kind of skewed left, skewed right um, distributions for cases where the uh, it, it becomes increasingly difficult to approach some large or some small value. Um, here's a very, very simple example. A normal distribution has a finite probability for every value of x. x can be infinitely big and infinitely small uh, either way. Um, think about temperature. Suppose you were measuring temperature said, well, the distribution of temperature values is normally distributed. Well, technically, that means there is a finite possibility of having a negative absolute temperature. Right? Normal distribution goes to infinity in both directions. And if it were temperature, uh, that means it goes to infinity in the negative direction as well. But we know that temperature cannot be below zero in the absolute Kelvin scale. Uh, so that's not possible. Maybe that normal distribution is close enough, but it can never be exactly true. This will happen any time that the physically allowable values of our variable do not extend from plus to minus infinity. But as I said, sometimes uh, it's approximately normal, and that might be good enough. The other way that our distribution can depart from normality is kurtosis. The other major way, right? These are the kind of the two big effects that we worry about. Uh, kurtosis about how heavy the tails are. We say the tails are heavy if, if they have a higher probability. So here I have in the orange a normal distribution. And then in the brown, the darker color, I have a distribution with what we say is higher kurtosis or heavy tails. So the PDF is larger uh, at, at these extreme values here and here than uh, we would otherwise have expected with the normal distribution. What that means is if we have these heavy tails, it means that extreme values are more likely than we would expect otherwise, or more likely than we expect for a normal distribution. If we have light tails, the PDF is smaller than a normal distribution at these extreme values, then, then the extreme values are less likely to occur. So uh, sometimes we're very interested in the likelihood of some extreme event happening. And therefore, knowing whether the tails are a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter than a normal distribution is quite important. So in real data, we experience both of these departures from normality, both skew and kurtosis. And later, we're going to look at how we can do some statistical tests for skew and kurtosis. But first, let's ask, what is the consequence? Of, of departures from normality. So our OLS, ordinary least squares, makes the assumption that our residuals are normally distributed. If we have only small departures from normality, then we're not going to see much impact. I mean, the uh, small imp uh, departures basically don't have much impact at all on our regression results. And we can safely continue on uh, using ordinary least squares regression even though we know that we don't get exactly a normal distribution of residuals. But if we start having large departures from normality, then we see two things. We see bias in the regression results, and we can see a decrease in the efficiency. That is, great uh, increases in the variance of the parameters and the predictions of our model. Now, ordinary least squares, under the assumption that normality is true, as well as the other assumptions, is a blue Regression. It is the best linear unbiased estimate. So it's unbiased and it's efficient. It has the lowest variance. We love those properties of the ordinary least squares. And of course, once we start 
uh, failing in our assumptions, in particular when we fail the assumption that the residuals are normally distributed about a zero mean, then we start to see a failure in the best linear unbiased estimate and the confidence intervals that we calculate assuming distribution of residuals will be wrong, be too small. The true confidence intervals will be bigger and we'll assume we've done a better job of fitting the data than we actually have. And this is why we need to check, find out whether or not we're going to trust our confidence intervals. So how can we determine the probability density function? How can we test whether our residuals are approximately normal? And if they're not, how can we estimate what that distribution is? Well, density estimation means construction of some estimate based on our observed data of what the PDF is. Now, the true PDF is unobservable because we can't observe the true population. We can only uh, observe samples that have some uncertainty in them, both from a sampling perspective and a measurement perspective. So we construct an estimate of the density. There are several ways to do that. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about a few of these, but there are, in fact, lots and lots of ways of estimating a PDF, and we will talk about the, what I think are the most important ones for people doing modeling work, regression work, but there are certainly others, some of them specific to certain circumstances. The thing we're probably most familiar with is the histogram. I'll show you that next. And there are ways of estimating uh, the density directly from the histogram by doing some smoothing. We're not going to do that. We'll, we'll do some graphical histograms to look at them, but we're not going to try to estimate the density based on the histograms. Instead, we're going to use QQ plots and moment tests, plus some other uh, tests for normality. Um, first, let's, let's talk about histograms, and then in the next lecture, we'll talk about QQ plots. What is a histogram? Well, a histogram, we, we, we take the range of possible x values, not the range of possible x values, let me back up a second. We take the range of all of the values of the thing that we're we're creating a histogram of. Maybe it's the uh, residuals, for example. Maybe it's I'm, I'm measuring the weight of an object and I measure it over and over again, and I get a, a, a range of values of that variable. Uh, we're going to use it mostly for looking at our residuals. So we have a range of residuals, and we take that range and we divide it up into bins. Each bin will have a certain you know, range. So if I have uh, a set range of all smallest to largest of residuals, and I divide it up into 10 bins. Each bin size is one tenth of the total range. Then I ask, how many of my data points fall within each bin? And I count them. We call that the frequency. And then we plot the frequency to count versus each of the bins. Uh, here's an example graph uh, as shown here. This is a qualitative tool, and it can be very hard to interpret because there's a lot of uncertainty in the counts for each individual bin. First of all, there's no objective way to find the best bin size, and the bin start value is also arbitrary. Uh, some rules of thumb that people use, uh, I show three of them here. The number of bins can be equal to the square root of the number of data points, or log two number of data points plus one, or two times the cube root of the number of data points. Um, these are all typical sorts of rules of thumb, heuristics, picking the number of bins. I just use the square root of n because that's the easiest. For example, if I had 100 data points, um, these three formulas would give me 10, 11, and 9 bins. So not a whole lot of difference between them. Uh, as n gets very large or very small, then we start seeing some differences. Uh, but because we don't have an, a way of, of deciding the best starting point or the best number of bins, we end up getting variations in the counts, plus the statistical variations. Every sample that we collect will very naturally have different values of counts for each bin. In fact, the relative uncertainty for each bin frequency is going to be something like 1 over the square root of the count. That means for the tails of the distribution, we only have a few values that actually land in those bins. 
the relative uncertainty in those values is going to be very high. And so it becomes hard to interpret uh, the, the shape of the tails, for example, because each bin is, is, has such high uncertainty. Well, as I said, there's something called kernel density estimation that, that smooths and tries to fit a function to this shape. Um, I don't particularly care for those kinds of estimation methods, and uh, we're not going to talk any more about them in class, but other people use them. Instead, we're going to, in the next lecture, look at QQ plots as what I think is a very powerful and underutilized tool for comparing a particular distribution to an assumption about that distribution. For example, comparing a set of data to a normal distribution. But that'll be the next lecture. This lecture, what have we learned? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. Does the central limit theorem guarantee that error distributions will be normal? What are two common ways an actual distribution departs from normality? And finally, problems with using a histogram to assess the shape of a probability distribution function. Well, that's lecture 10. Till next time.